it's a special honor and a great pleasure to welcome Staatsminister Michael Roth to the School of Public Policy here at CEU this evening. Michael Roth will speak about strengthening democracy and open societies in Europe. And it does not happen very often that all things fit nicely together and one can say this is the right topic at the right time, in the right place, and most of all, with the right speaker. I'm quite sure. Today is one of those rare moments, and let me just briefly explain why that is the case. Strengthening democracy and open societies is, of course, an important topic at any given point in time. As our founder and funder, George Soros, often reminds us, democracy and open societies are a promise. The promise of a society where rights are respected, government is accountable, and no one, no one has the monopoly on the truth. But as George Soros also constantly reminds us, this promise is rarely fully realized and is always under threat. And of course, the 20th century in Europe can be told as a bloody story of the open society and its enemies. For half of Europe, real democracies with full rights and welfare emerged in the decades after the end of World War II. The other half of Europe had to wait until 1989 until it could even think about starting to realize that very promise. And so a few weeks before the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, Though few are in a celebratory mood, many citizens feel alienated from established parties and populist movements are rising across all of Europe. Democratically elected leaders such as Prime Minister Orban talk about the end of liberal democracy and hoping to build an illiberal state on national foundations. An autocratic Russia casts a big shadow on Europe's borders and while many of Europe's economies no longer seem to be able to support the dream of a good life for a broad middle class. For many, an autocratic and increasingly prosperous China even seems to offer a more efficient alternative. So it is the right time to think about strengthening democracies and open societies in Europe. CEU and Budapest are also the right place to do so, CEU, as you all know, is a university with an open society mission. And at the School of Public Policy, we have purpose beyond power as our guiding principle. At the same time, in Budapest, we find ourselves at one of those epicenters of the efforts to roll back democracy and open societies. And that is why CEU has launched the Frontiers of Democracy series seeking to promote open debate, discussion, and the exchange of ideas about the nature and the state of democracy in today's Europe, and for that matter, all around the world. This evening's discussion is part of this series, and we could not have found a better speaker to discuss strengthening democracy and open society in Europe than Michael Roth. Since December 2013, Michael Roth has been Minister of State for Europe at the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And in this role, he is the key person in the Ministry on Bilateral Relations with European Partners and on all EU matters. In this role, he also participates in the meetings of the German Cabinet and also often represents Germany in Brussels. But Michael Wood is not just a top government official. Since 1988, he has been a directly elected member to the German parliament and throughout his parliamentary career. 1988. 1988, did I say? 90, I'm sorry, yeah. 19. <laughs> I'm not as old <laughs> as you expected. <laughs> so it is 1988. 98. He has been directly elected member to the German parliament and throughout his parliamentary career. He has been a very outspoken supporter of them. Maybe it would have been better if you had been there earlier. <laughs> outspoken supporter of a democratic and socially just European Union. 
and spending most weekends in his mostly rural constituency in Hesse, far away from the Berlin and Brussels bubbles, dare I say, gives him an up-to-date feeling for the real concerns of the citizens. Michael Roth is also a great friend of Hungary. He has visited Hungary many times over the past 15 years and greatly cares about democracy and open society in this country. We're very happy to host this event in cooperation with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, whose Budapest office director, Jan Niklas Engels, is here with us this evening. Thank you very much for doing this, for partnering with us. And we look forward <coughs> to Michael Ward's remarks and to the discussion with all of you that were fellow. Again, welcome. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you with us here this evening. Thank you. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, students, friends, Thank you very much uh, to Wolfgang Reinecke, my good old friend Thorsten Beller, and Jan Engels from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you here in Budapest today to look at a topic that's of great importance for the EU, both for its own cohesion and for its credibility in the eyes of the public. Why is it so important to talk about strengthening democracy and open societies today? Why do we need a fresh look at the way we protect our shared values in the EU, such as democracy, the rule of law, the protection of ethnic and sexual minorities, freedom of the media, and our individual liberties? 2014 is a year that brings back painful and joyful memories of events which have an impact of the shape of the European Union as it is today. Both the painful and the joyful memories show why we should never take these achievements for granted. The European integration process was in part a consequence of the catastrophes of the 20th century. The outbreak of the, world, of the First World War 100 years ago and the outbreak of the Second World War 75 years ago. Nazi Germany's aggression sought the systemic eradication of Europe's Jews. European integration was meant not only to end Germany in order to prevent any future aggression, but also to promote fundamental values, individual freedom and prosperity. That represented hope for all European citizens, or almost all. The Eastern and Central European states were not able to join this process from the beginning, but had to wait until the Iron Curtain, which divided the continent for decades, was finally torn down. What a great moment when citizens in Poland, Hungary, and elsewhere brought down their communist governments. And I can assure you, as Germany's Minister of State for Europe, I'm still very grateful to Hungary and its citizens for being such a support at that time. Of course, courageous political leaders like Müller Horn and Miklos Nemet were needed, but it was the ordinary members of the public and their longing for democracy and freedom which provided the driving force. Their courage, hope, and optimism spread out across the continent. My own world back then was very different to what it is today. I looked out on walls, fences, and self-firing weapon systems as I grew up just a few meters from the inner German border. But things started happening in 1989. The EU enlargement that followed has been a success story. That was probably the best thing the EU could have done to encourage transformation. And transformation is a bumpy road. Looking at our neighborhood and beyond today, we are seeing again that people are willing to pay a very high price to make that change happen and join our community. It's true. Europe's values have not lost their appeal. A glance around our neighborhood is enough to illustrate this. The EU flag is flying on the Maidan in Kiev because people there believe in Europe's values. Refugees from Africa 
are putting their lives at risk because they hope to be safe from persecution and enjoy a life in dignity in Europe. But looking at us, it seems to me that we have grown so used to all the benefits that European integration has brought us that we only ever get annoyed but by it, but its perceived shortcomings. When pictures of Ukrainians with EU flags were broadcast, it seemed like we were surprised to be considered so attractive. We should be neither surprised nor proud, but willing to accept that we have to meet high expectations. The crisis in our neighborhood and beyond, along with the financial and economic crisis, well, has brought times of great uncertainty. We can't afford this uncertainty if we want the EU to remain capable of acting as a global player, capable of acting as a safeguard, democracy and economic and social stability, capable of being a role model to other parts of the world. We need to set a good example by living up to our ideals at home. The European model has been thrown into tough international competition, up against other socio-political concepts. We can't assume that, we, that the brand will simply sell itself. It needs to keep on proving its worth day by day. Other brands come along, come along that also promise economic success and security. But, and this is the point, without freedom, democracy and solidarity being part of a deal in the way that is so characteristic of the EU. This is and should stay our advantage. Ladies and gentlemen, as I see it, there are four, ma there are four main challenges we need to tackle in order to strengthen democracy within the EU. First, the EU is not just a single market or monetary union. It's first and foremost a union of values. Defending and strengthening our values is crucial and starts at home. The past few years have shown how helpless the EU still is when fundamental values come under threat in its own member states. If we want to remain credible as a community of values, we have to speak up and take action whenever there is a breach of fundamental values. Democracies, the rule of law, cultural and religious diversity, the protection of minorities and freedom of the press, these values are all trademarks of the EU. They bind us Europeans together. And let me be very clear here. The classic principle of non-intervention in the internal affairs of sovereign states doesn't apply in the EU. On the contrary, to my, to my mind, we in fact have a duty to talk openly and frankly among friends. We are too close for something that happens in one member state not to affect the others. If blame falls on, of, of, on one of us, it falls on us all. It won't be just one country being criticized for a breach of fundamental values. We all will all be asked why we did not react. We must live up to these basic values ourselves without reservation if we are to demand the same from others. At long last, we need universal, objective and binding standards and a political process to ensure that our fundamental values are consistently upheld. And this applies equally to all member states. I don't want to remain silent about the fact that there are concerns about some developments here in Hungary, but at the same time, I want to underline that I could also name others. Anti-Semitism, homophobia, and anti-Siganism are problems elsewhere in Germany too. Nevertheless, being a close friend of Hungary and having worked on our relations in various capacities over many years, I can't hide my concern at the developments in Hungary. A constitution has been passed without any broad debate. The media seem to be under a lot of pressure, as does the judiciary and being active at a non-governmental level doesn't seem to be always an easy task. 
Each of these alone already goes against my personal understanding of democracy and open society. But taken in sum, these actions put our common framework of values under strain. I am not liberal in an economic sense, but when it comes to human rights and human dignity and their individual and universal significance, I couldn't not be more liberal. Rising doubts about the European Convention on Human Rights and discussions about how to suspend the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights at a national level, as we are seeing in the UK, are outrageous. You see, this is a definitely not about turning a blind eye to some member states and blaming the others. But I do admit that we have probably been too indulgent in the past. We said nothing about developments in Italy under Berlusconi, for example, for many years. Still, this mistake shouldn't prevent us from being friend, frank and open in the present and the future. We should rather learn our lesson from past mistakes. Furthermore, I'm convinced that isolation doesn't help. That's why Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union is not the right answer. Article 7 involves depriving a member state of voting rights for breaching our fundamental values. This is such a tough measure that it would probably impede any solution-oriented dialogue. I would like us all to avoid any isolation and work together on common answers in a constructive manner. That's exactly why I'm here for. But let me first get back to those four challenges for strengthening democracy. Here is the second. The European elections have been a wake-up call. Eurosceptic and populist parties are gaining influence in the European Parliament. In Germany, a clear pro-European attitude used to be a unifying factor across the political spectrum. This has changed with the rise of the Alternative for Germany party, AfD. Restoring confidence will take a lot. The community method was undermined in the aftermath of the crisis, as certain decisions needed to be taken by governments overnight. This makes it all the more important now to get back to the community method. The community method specifically involves everyone taking joint responsibility for Europe. Furthermore, strengthening the European Parliament as well as the national parliaments is the right answer to the so-called democratic deficit. Parliaments need to, be need to hold open debates in order to gain acceptance and ensure consistent democratic legitimacy for European policy decisions. Thirdly, and let me be very clear here, the fight against tremendously high youth unemployment is not only an economic matter, but also affects the stability of political systems and societies. Europe can't afford to leave a whole generation behind. A generation which, which sees the EU not as part of the solution, but as part of the problem. Europe has to see itself as much more of a social corrective. Initiatives for growth have been launched, as have investment programs and the youth employment initiative. The fruits of greater social security will in the end include greater stability of democracies and open societies too. Fourthly, our democratic systems are based on the principle that there are always majorities and minorities. As a politician, I'm used to dealing with decisions taken by a majority, even I was part of the minority. However, political decisions do need, do need to be inclusive if they are to be accepted by the minority. This requires not only effective opposition, but also public debate. What happened in Germany after the last election might serve as an example. The Grand Coalition gained a vast majority in the Parliament, but particular rights were given to the opposition. This means that the opposition is still capable of being part of debates and processes. A large majority means a huge responsibility. 
The strength of our democracies can in part be measured by the way we deal with minorities, with the opposition, with the more vulnerable in our societies in general. You see, the inclusiveness I'm talking about goes beyond parliamentary procedures. It means active and vibrant civil society, which is able to articulate different views and interests. Our future here in Europe will in large be a part be decided in our marketplaces, in our schools, in our universities, and above all in our hearts and minds. Two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to deliver a speech at the Berlin Humboldt University in front of German students, and I can just repeat what I said there. Make the most of the wide range of opportunities that Europe offers you. And above all, have your say. As young citizens, it's up to you to help shape the Europe if of tomorrow. The task of giving Europe direction is in your hands and needs of your minds. Your attitudes, dear students, will be crucial in determining whether we allow backward-looking and resentful debates to predominate or are prepared to confidently take Europe's future into our own hands. Europe is the dream of diversity, the guarantor of our individual ways of life, our life insurance in this turbulent age of globalization. I am convinced that by strengthening solidarity and social cohesion in Europe, by defending our values and by taking more responsibility in our neighborhood, we will make the EU stronger. We should allow ourselves to learn from our one another. That way, Europe as a political and social project will emerge from the crisis stronger than it was before. Thank you very much for your attention. Are you in favor of setting in, uh, in motion 
uh, by the operation and uh, the framework of the, 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 the European Commission has worked out uh, the rule of law framework. And uh, do you think that the, what, what do you think is the Council going to approve mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. So, ah, okay. Thank you uh, for the questions and the comments. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to uh, emphasize um, uh, more details about our uh, initiative uh, for a new mechanism, mechanism in order to strengthen uh, the rule of law and the fundamental rights within the EU. I'm very grateful to my predecessor, Michel Link, from the Liberal Party, who started a joint initiative with other ministers for Europe, all over Europe, um, uh, to, to, to invite the EU to, um, to establish such a mechanism. But this is a long and bumpy road. It takes years and months. But uh, I'm really satisfied about the progress this project has made. In March, the um, EU Commission uh, introduced a communication which makes it very clear this is not only a project of uh, some EU member states, this is a project of the EU represented by the EU Commission. Um, this project is uh, is on the top of the political agenda of the current Italian presidency. And we agreed to start a general de the second general debate uh, in the General Affairs Council meeting in November, together with the new uh, first vice president of the EU Commission, Franz Timmermans. Uh, Franz Timmermans is very strong committed to this project. And I'm very optimistic that we are, we, will, we are going to find a political consensus. You know very well this is a very sensitive issue. But it's not a controversial issue between the Western European states and the Central and Eastern European states. A couple of months ago, I uh, published a joint article together with my colleague from the Czech Republic. And we underlined the importance, the crucial importance of this project. I know very well that the Article 7, as an atomic bomb, doesn't work. And I do believe that sanctions, a new mechanism with sanctions, couldn't be very useful. We need a political mechanism, non-discriminatory mechanism with objective and binding standards for 28 new member states. Um, I'm very open about the structure. We do, it's not necessary to establish new institutions. And the most sensitive um, discussion is how is the um, role of the Council and how is the role and the influence of the EU Commission. Um, at the end, we have to find compromise. But it would be very, very useful if the representatives of civil society all over Europe would um, support us and assist us with concrete ideas and proposals for an institutional framework of this project. This is a unique chance for all of us to strengthen the rule of law and the fundamental rights. But we can't wait 
for changing the treaty. We need a solution now, as soon as possible. And that's why I'm very much in favor of a um, political mechanism, not a legal mechanism. And we need within the council meetings, within the commission, but it's more helpful to start such a debate within the council meetings, um, such a broad and general debate about problems and challenges in some EU member states would make it easier um, to, to um, um, implement uh, an intelligent structure of pressure, political pressure. Without political pressure, it won't work. And for politicians, it's always dangerous to be under pressure by the media, by civil society, and by NGOs. And I would like to come back to the question of the um, former member of parliament uh, behind. Um, I don't have a very intelligent answer to you. Because um, the freedom of the press is part, not only part of the European understanding of our common values, it's a crucial part of each national constitution. And uh, we need no a, a special legislative process in order to strengthen um, the freedom of press, from my point of view, is not necessary because it's up to the national governments to protect the freedom of press and to invite um, journalists, to invite critics to be part of a vibrant and vital civil society. <coughs> um, the role of the parliaments. Just a very brief uh, comment. We need a new um, balance between the European Parliament and the national parliaments. Um, the European Parliament, together with the Council of Ministers, plays the key role for the decision making process of the EU. But the European and the national parliaments should play a much more constructive role. There is the option um, um, to, to scrutinize the, oh, the S principle, what does, a subsidiarity principle. But this is much more a de deconstructive uh, and not really constructive uh, role of the national parliaments. There is the option of a red card, for instance. Uh, there is an option for a blockade, and that's not enough. I made the proposal that um, the national parliaments should introduce an uh, initiative for a new um, law on the European level. Not to say just what uh, the national parliaments deny or what they want to withdraw, the national parliaments should play a much, uh, much more constructive role. And I presented the idea, it's not very new and fresh, uh, for a Euro uh, parliament. Um, we, one of our most crucial challenges is to strengthen the economic and monetary union. We, meet, we need much more binding um, standards in economic policy, labor policy, education, social policy for the member states of the Eurozone. But we don't, we shouldn't start a discussion about new competences for the EU level. I don't see any chance for changing the treaty within the next five years or seven years. But there is a 
huge obligation to protect the Euro and to um, implement binding standards for social protection, for labor policy. It make, makes it much easier for the ordinary people at the street, so at the street, that the EU is going to deliver positive results for their daily life. But this is a very, very ambitious project. I know that there is that there are many reservations within the European Parliament against such a new and ambitious cooperation and new cooperation within the national parliaments and the European Parliament. But it's an idea. And probably this idea will survive in the next years. Okay, floor is open. a question here. Thanks. Barash uh, Kosha <coughs> uh, from Poland uh, site and Edo Gage U. Well, I tell you since just in the recent weeks, actually, we can experience uh, um, a very different attitude uh, from the US government, actually, that uh, they raise more and more open criticism uh, about the uh, concrete Hungarian uh, uh, problems, concrete Hungarian concerns. Uh, since you uh, expressed some concerns from the German government, actually, towards Hungarian issues, can we expect such kind of uh, changing attitude from your government as well? Mm -hmm. This is Peter Mulvary from RTV Online. Uh, I just want to join the previous question at the topic of it. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, uh, the German newspaper, the Welt, uh, raised the question openly that uh, uh, Hungary needs EU, but uh, is it true that the European Union really needs Hungary? Do you see uh, a possibility of uh, 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 excluding Hungary in any way from the European Union or practicing any kind of stronger pressure on the Hungarian government. So why don't we go ahead with those? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, today I, I have had several meetings and um, all my uh, past partners asked uh, what are the consequences, the European consequences, on the EU, uh, on, on, on the US, United States uh, uh, decision to um, introduce uh, measures and sanctions uh, to Hungary. Um, sanctions are not the solution for the European Union. This is not just a bilateral conflict. Um, and I don't want to comment the United States measures. But I'm totally convinced that the European Union has to find another political answer. Uh, because Germany and Hungary uh, are part of a political family and a union of values. And we have binding structures and institutions which are responsible for such sensitive questions, especially combat corruption. This is one of the most crucial parts of good governance within the European Union. Um, the Hungarian government made the same mistake like many other governments within the EU. All the benefits, the good things, come from Berlin, Budapest, Paris, Bratislava, and, uh, and for the bad things, the bureaucratic monster in Brussels is responsible for. 
That is a horrible burden sharing. And we won't survive with this strategy. And I would like to highlight the necessity to speak in a much more constructive way about Europe. And, and I hope that there is a chance for all of us to um, present a European Union which puts the most crucial challenges on the top of the political agenda. And such a political agenda, such a strategic agenda, legit, exists with a new president of the EU Commission. And, uh, and there is a political consensus between the EU Commission and the head of states and governments to uh, deliver positive results to the ordinary people. More measures and initiatives, jobs, growth, social cohesion, or uh, energy policy. It's a very sensitive issue, especially for the Central and Eastern European countries. Um, there is one main problem within the EU. A strategy, how we present our concerns and disappointments within the EU doesn't exist. Um, and this is a special obligation for the members of the European People's Party. Because Mr. Orban is, belongs to his party, Fidesz, belongs to the European People's Party. party. And this, there is not a <coughs> coalition of uh, extremely left-wing politicians uh, all over Europe to criticize a conservative, um, national-oriented government like the Finnish government in Hungary. Um, the Social Democrats and the left, center-left representatives within the European Union are in minority. Eight commissioners from 28 are social democrats or socialists. Um, I'm not quite sure, 11 or 12 head of states and governments are social democrats or central left politicians. And there is no um, blockade left radical left wing blockade in Brussels against a democratic elected government here in Hungary. This is absolutely nonsense. It isn't true. But the most sensitive issue is is there a chance for an open and frank debate about concerns and about disappointments. And the content of my little speech was we should be courage, courageous and we should be more open and more frank in our bilateral <coughs> contacts. But it would be easier for the EU. It's not my Chancellor's job. And it not, it's not my Foreign Minister's job to be responsible for the risky things alone. I have had several meetings with my colleagues all over Europe. Always the same concerns about Hungary, about Bulgaria, about Romania, and other members. The same crit criticism to the United Kingdom. But always the same. It's not in our national uh, interest to criticize our partners. It would be great if you could criticize Hungary or the Bulgarian government 
or our friends in Bucharest. It won't work. The new first, first vice president of the EU Commission, Franz Timmermans, is going to play the key role because strengthening fundamental rights, rule of law, is on the top of his portfolio. And the EU should be more open. And that's why we should strengthen the position of the Council of Ministers. the law. 
such as democracy in open and inclusive societies. This is an open decision-making process. And without public acceptance, it wouldn't work. And um, another, I, I don't see a chance for another mechanism with political sanctions. We need a political consensus. And a mechanism with political sanctions does still subsist. <coughs> exist. Uh, it's, it's based on the Article 7, on the EU treaties. But I don't, I'm not convinced that this is an acceptable solution. Um, I mentioned the EU as a role model, but our role model is under pressure. There is a very tough competition with other political models. Um, the unique European model combines democracy, rule of law, solidarity with prosperity and with economic competition and with prosperity. But now the EU can't deliver. If more than 50% of the younger generation is without work, if the youth unemployment rate in more than 20 EU member states is higher than 20 or 25 percent, the EU doesn't deliver. This, the current situation has nothing to do with social cohesion and with fairness. Nothing. That's why I'm very much in favor that the EU should do much more for social cohesion. Competition is a wonderful word. Competitiveness is a wonderful, fascinating project. But without social cohesion, public acceptance can't exist, will not exist. And I, last week I visited Greece. In Greece, there are no chances for the younger generation. And there is a tremendous rate, rise of anti-European and extremely nationalist parties. The Golden Dawn is a neo-fascistic neo party. And um, most of the younger people vote for this party. And the political alternative to François Hollande is not Mr. Sarkozy. The alternative is Marine Le Pen. And that's why we all, together, should play a much more constructive role to our French friends. We should stabilize pro-European democratic parties and movements. Um, sorry, I have to... Ah, companies. I'm not an expert in these economic questions, but I'm totally convinced that most of the companies, social stability, a free and inclusive <coughs> society, a society and a political system without corruption is of, cru of crucial importance. <coughs> um, corruption is just interested, interesting for the big companies, but for the smaller and medium-sized enterprises there's no chance to survive with corruption. That's why the EU changed its political agenda for the accession process. In the last negotiations about accession, 
we started with the details of the single market. Now we started our accessions with the rule of law. The accession as a candidate countries or the accession countries has to deliver in the most sensitive issues. That's combat corruption, respect to ethnic, sexual, cultural, religious minorities, and strengthening the rule of law. And it's not only in, in, in the interest of the ordinary people and of a vibrant civil society, it's always in the interest of companies. Without rule of law, without independence of judiciary, there is no chance for uh, companies to be successful. But, uh, it's awesome. um, I know very well <laughs> um, what the, that the, um, the companies should improve their efforts. Um, this is much more silence. They should play a much more cons constructive role in order to present their own demands. And this demand shouldn't focus on competitiveness. This, the, the demand should also include rule of law, stable economic and social society. Sometimes I'm a little bit disappointed about the silence of the companies. But this is not a, a Hungarian phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. So you think that's just one question about timing, uh, democratic norms, performance on democratic norms to EU funding, just like the EU does it with the budget? Is that something Germany supports? Uh, who has to pay the price for sanctions within the funds? We have had very controversial debates about this proposal. Um, I don't know exactly the structure or the, 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 the structure here in Hungary, but in Germany or in most of the uh, in most of the other EU member states, the local administrations has to pay the price for a lack of democracy and rule of law on the national uh, on the national level. That's a problem why I'm a little bit reserved to this idea. Yeah. I have to look to Alexander because she's an expert in this issue. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> What's scrapping it for budgets, since that also ties into EU funding and automatically, obviously, local administration. First of all, I would like to introduce a political mechanism. And um, in, the, in the long run, this could be another solution. Um, but the first step, the first step is the most crucial one, is to start with a political me mechanism. And we have to overcome all these reservations within the EU. You should know this is very, 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 very difficult. I would like to invite you to discuss this issue with my friends in the United Kingdom. <coughs> you just mentioned that the open debate is uh, made the strongest pressure on government. Just, just yesterday there were huge demonstrations in Budapest mm -hmm. against the taxation of the internet. Uh, what do you think about this proposal? <laughs>
for a vibrant democracy. Um, I don't know exactly why the Hungarian government uh, introduced this bill. Um, my own experiences with um, the net and with, um, with uh, the whole sensible, I sensible issue with data and so on. Um, digital, thank you very much. The digital, digital issue is one of the most sensitive for politicians. It's very easy to make mistakes. It's more or less impossible to deliver success. And. Um, I can't understand, because I don't know the details, why the Hungarian government um, introduced this project. Because um, some ordinary people and users expect that this is more or less a discriminatory uh, measure to control or to minimize activities um, in the net, and this is not acceptable for 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 open and inclusive democratic society. Society, but I don't have further details. I don't know exactly what's the motivation of the Hungarian government to introduce such a bill. Okay, there's a question all the way to the back. Hello, uh, I'm Simon Griffin, I'm a faculty member here at CEU. Um, you can't have an open society without defending its borders, without security. Um, and uh, an immediate threat to the EU seems to be uh, Russia at the moment, uh, and potential Hungarian collaboration in, in cutting off the gas supply to Russia, uh, to Ukraine as, as the winter approaches. And that seems like a very immediate problem that the EU faces and that the EU institutions themselves can't do very much about. So I'd like you to speak to what measures are available to uh, uh, to force the Hungarian government to stay in line with the EU on this, if, if that becomes necessary, and what measures your government might be prepared to take. Um, my government, especially the Chancellor and our foreign ministers, Foreign Minister is very strong committed to uh, a common strategy um, of the EU against Russia. Russia is Russia, Russia attacked the international law, and uh, this was not only an attack against the Ukraine, it was an attack of the international and the European community and we could never accept it. And it was very hard for all of us in Germany to implement a new strategy against Russia. But um, we, this was a success story because the EU speaks with one single voice based on a common strategy. And you know very well that this is one of the most sensitive issues. Um, you have EU member states, especially in Central, Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe, which, uh, um, which are very dependent on the gas and oil supplies from Russia. More than 90% of the oil and the gas comes from Russia. And this is a question of solidarity for the EU as a whole. <coughs> Nobody can stand alone. And that's why we put this project, Energy Union, on the top of the strategic agenda. Um, <laughs> neither Germany nor Hungary, Hungary uh, could solve this problem alone. We should overcome the national interests 
and we should introduce a common strategy of the EU. And I know the most crucial issue is are the economic measures and the sanctions. There is no chance to change or to withdraw or to reject these measures without um, accepting the uh, Minsk agreement by the Russian government. The Russian government, Mr. Putin, has to fulfill 100% of the content of the Minsk agreement. And there is a big political consensus within the EU that this is the precondition for a new debate on economic <coughs> sanctions and political measures against Russia. Um, we're almost out of time. Maybe I can also ask you a question and that um, relates to Europe's identity and its sources of identity. In many ways, Europe identity was very much driven by external forces. Initially, the whole European project was driven by its history. Then we had uh, many decades of another external force, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Both of those seem to fade away. History, of course, dissipates and fades away, and so at least until recently did the Cold War. And it was interesting to see precisely with the re-emergence of the Cold War, there was almost a relief that Europe could find again its own identity, but again it was an external force. In order for the European project to ultimately succeed, what are, in your view, the, the inner sources of Europe's identity? Where do they come from? Or do we need to have an external threat and an enemy as the way this whole project was born? Mm -hmm. Where do you see the, the cohesion? You know, you, you, yes, we need the social cohesion, but what are the inner sources? How can <coughs> How can Europe unite from within, mm -hmm. rather than it being driven by an outside mm -hmm. threat? Mm -hmm. um, I have a very high expectation to the younger generation, uh, which grew up in the United Europe, a Europe without frontiers, without borders. You can live wherever you want, you can search for a job wherever you want. Sometimes I miss clear commitments of the younger generation, of intellectuals, of artists, in order to defend the European idea the integration idea. This debate, debate is uh, dominated by nationalistic um, arguments in most of the EU member states. And I'm extremely concerned about that. And, on the, I, and I don't want to speak about enemies. But um, you shouldn't underestimate the influence of other social political models. <clears throat> My uh, model I don't like very much is the so-called Singapore model. I know it's difficult to compare the EU with, with a city-state like Singapore. But in Singapore, prosperity, security, order, and um, good circumstances <coughs> do exist without rule of law and without democracy and a civil and a vibrant civil society. But it works. And it works quite well. And it could be an attractive model for other regions. For instance, for the Eastern European countries like the Ukraine, or Georgia, or Moldova. We introduced 
a European perspective for Eastern Europe, but uh, an EU perspective for this region doesn't exist. And everybody knows that the EU perspective was, was the most successful offer to other European countries to work very hard for democracy, rule of law, and liberal and inclusive societies. And probably, if we can't deliver, other political models, not as enemies, but as competitors, become more important. That's my major concern. And I miss sometimes the criticism and the inspiration of the younger generation. I would like to invite you. <coughs> Probably there is a chance for you to become more influent because in most of them, most of my colleagues would be very glad for new fresh ideas, for new initiatives, new projects. And now it's a, it's a chance. And just you should take take the chance. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. On that note, we'll take up the challenge. Um, but I want to thank you very much for coming, coming here, coming to Hungary, coming to Budapest. As as we all noted, I think both in your answers, but in all the very excellent questions, these are difficult times. Um, democracy is under stress, but not just in this country. As you rightly said, it's all over Europe. Um, as, the, as the European parliamentary elections and other elections have shown. This debate will continue, and I hope you can come back. But for now, your answers, your frank and open answers, are very much appreciated. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you.